before the break, we talked about n-step backups. Eligibility traces let you basically uh, do compound backups, where you average these with some weights. Okay, and one particular scheme for doing this kind of weighting is this sort of exponential weighting, where you have a parameter lambda, and you think of all the possible n-steps, and now you weigh them uh, in this particular fashion. Uh, so that's the, there's many different versions of how to do this. Uh, but all of them rely on this kind of exponential discounting in some form with a parameter lambda. Um, and so the way you think about it is that you take all of your uh, n-step returns, they're all sort of mashed together. Uh, this seems a little bit crazy, but actually has a very nice incremental implementation that I'm going to show you uh, that uh, gives you uh, good complexity per, uh, per update. Okay. And uh, there's an interesting relationship with Monte Carlo and TD0. Basically, uh, if you set this parameter lambda to 1, you get the Monte Carlo target with just a little bit of algebra. I can show that. And if you set it to 0, you get the TD0 target. So that's good. Um, OK, so now what does the algorithm look like? Uh, the algorithm sort of takes this kind of forward view and, and flips it back. Okay, and so the way you think about it is now instead of thinking of the agent sort of sitting at a state and looking at the trajectory forward and taking all the samples from that trajectory and doing an update, you think of the agent actually sit sitting at the next state and where it's seen the update and sort of shouting it back. Okay, so it shouts it back along all the trajectory, but the amplitude gets attenuated as the states go further and further back in time. And so the previous state gets most of the update, and then the other states get a little bit less and a little bit less and so on, but everybody gets some of this update. So that's kind of nice because it's much more like Monte Carlo. If you have one trajectory, the outcome of that trajectory gets kind of spread around everywhere, okay? Um, and, um, and that's kind of, uh, the, you know, in some sense, making most of, of use of this, this data. At the same time, it still has this feel that the states that are closest to where the errors has happened are going to get most of the blame for that error, which is, which is a feature that can be helpful. Uh, okay, so now what does the algorithm look like? The algorithm is going to maintain an extra set of parameters. So if you have a set of parameters for your function approximator, that's theta, you're going to have now an extra set of parameters, that's this eligibility trace, and we're going to keep updating it. And the simplest version of this algorithm is basically to say we start the eligibility trace to zero, that means nobody's eligible yet for updates. And then we're going to accumulate information in this vector, okay? And the way we do it is we always add the gradient, the new gradient, and we decay the old value by gamma lambda. Okay? Then a new gradient comes in, we add it in, we decay all the old values by gamma lambda. And the update for the value function, okay, now is going to have this eligibility trace instead of just having the gradient. Okay? So the update to the parameter vector is going to be based on the temporal difference error but multiplied by the eligibility rather than multiplied just by the gradient, which is what we had before. So if we were to set lambda to zero, we would get exactly TD zero. But if we set lambda to some other intermediate value, we're going to get this kind of propagation of gradients a little bit everywhere. Um, of course, lambda is a parameter, so you're going to have now yet another thing <laughs> that you have to optimize, okay? That creates a trade-off. Yes? Uh, so we are going to look forward and shout backward at the same time? Yes, we always look forward. We for shout backward just one path or like all possible paths? <laughs> Only one path, the path that has happened. Okay. Only the path that has happened. There's an interesting question of what would happen if you wanted to shout back on more than one path. Uh, and how to implement that. So there is, uh, some people would really like to know how to do that. There's this interesting work on synthetic gradients. There's a couple papers on that that are kind of in that vein. Uh, <clears throat> so they try to say, you know, before actually an error has happened, they try to say, well, uh, what would, you know, what do I estimate this error to be and how would it propagate backwards? 
but it's it's a very open kind of research topic right now. Okay. Um, and so now you have a trade-off with respect to lambda rather than with respect to fixed number of steps. It looks kind of the same. Okay, you have U-shaped curves with this with respect to the step size parameter. You have lambda equal to zero, which is TD performing worse than intermediate values. You have Monte Carlo on top there performing terribly, uh, as, as it usually uh, tends to do. So eligibility traces are nice. There's actually different kinds of flavors and varieties. Uh, the book has a lot of detail on that. I'm not really going to have uh, time to, uh, to go over that today. Uh, because I want to show you one other kind of reinforcement learning, which is quite popular right now, which is called policy gradient. Okay? And so let me uh, sort of first try to uh, explain this, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the structure of these policies might be. So the kinds of approaches that we've discussed so far are all based on estimating values. Okay? Specifically, in the control case, we estimate action values, and then we build policies from these action values. But the critical thing, the thing that we parameterize is the action value function. Okay? Now, there are some cases in which you don't want to think about the parameterization of the value function, and instead you'd rather think about how you might parameterize the policy directly. Okay? So I'll give you an example. We did some work with Hydro-Quebec at some point for controlling power plants. Okay? So the idea was, uh, you know, you have weather and rain and whatever, and you have these dams, and you have to uh, control how much water you want to let through the dam. And there's a variety of things that you're trying to optimize. On one hand, you like to make money, but on the other hand, you like to not flood the neighborhood and you like to not kill the fish and so on. So it's a complicated reinforcement learning problem with quite nonlinear and known dynamics because there's weather and water inflows and things like this. But uh, policies typically have very simple forms, okay? You start, you open the dam, and then you stop, okay? So policies that are implemented are all what people call linear threshold policies, right? When you have water level above a certain threshold, you open, you open linearly, and then at some point you stop, okay? The value function is murder because value function has to depend on all kinds of things that vary in complicated ways, and we don't have very much data to estimate it. The policies are very simple. <clears throat> and that's actually often the case in complicated continuous control problems. Right? Robotics is the same thing. People have certain types of controllers that they can code on the robot. Value functions might be messy, but the controller shape actually is pretty well understood and pretty well defined. Maybe you have something like linear Gaussian controllers, right? Uh, but you know, maybe you have PID controllers, you want to parameterize those but it's not uh, sort of that, uh, that bad. So policy gradient methods focus on the policy. They parameterize the policy. The policy is assumed to be stochastic because we need to get data everywhere, and we're going to do gradients in order to update these parameters. And um, sometimes we use the value function as an indication of where to go. And that's the kind of method that actually I kind of like the best, which is called an actor-critic architecture, okay? So in an actor-critic architecture, the actor is the policy, okay? And you actually typically also have an estimate of the value function, and you use that to guide the direction in which the policy will change. <clears throat> of course, in principle, that's not necessary. You could do some other form of search in policy space. For example, you could do randomized uh, policy search, you could do an evolutionary method, and so on. But if you have information about the direction that's most reliable, you might as well use it. And that information, typically for us, comes in the form of this temporal difference, or TDR. And so we're going to try to capitalize on that. Okay, and like I said, sometimes uh, it's easier to approximate the values of these policies. Uh, but the other interesting thing here is that uh, you can change the policy in some smooth way by design because of the shape that it has. Um, and you don't need to do maxes at every step. And of course, the max is fine when you have a small discrete set of actions. But when you're doing continuous control, just computing the max in order to decide what to do 
can be pretty problematic, right? Because that's now a continuous optimization problem. And so having the policy directly parameterized helps you to skip that step. Okay, so now what's the policy gradient setup? The idea is that we have the policy parameterized now by a parameter vector theta, okay? And uh, now we can get uh, gradients, okay, with respect to this parameter vector. And one of the interesting sort of relationships that we're going to leverage, okay, is this relationship on top there, right? that the gradient of pi divided by pi is actually the gradient of log pi. Okay. So, it, you know, it's simple, but it's going to be very useful when we're going to do our computations. What's our objective? As usual, the objective is to maximize return. Okay, so we're going to have some value function. It may or may not be explicitly parameterized. We could also estimate it in Monte Carlo fashion from samples at the point that we, we need it. Okay. But what we would like is to take a direction in parameter space, in theta space, in such a way that the value function improves. Okay? So we're going to do stochastic gradient ascent now, okay? ascent on the value function. We're going to update the parameter vector of the policy in the direction that most improves the value function. And again, we're going to have a step size as usual right, that controls the magnitude of these updates. And... Um, now, the question is, can we actually compute this somehow nicely? And there's this very nice paper from uh, 1999 that basically presents this policy gradient theorem that says, oh, this gradient actually has a very nice closed form solution, okay, which um, then allows us to, uh, to work with just the policy. And this q pi here, this is the action value function we can parameterize this separately, or we can just estimate it in Monte Carlo fashion whenever we need it. What is dpi again? dpi is the stationary distribution of the policy. So it sort of looks daunting, but basically what we're going to do is if we sample, if we always sample on trajectories, then we're fine because we're acting according to dpi. Any other questions? Okay, so there's a proof here. I'm not sure if I want to go through all of this, okay? There's two main ideas to this proof, okay? One idea is we use gradients, okay? And so we just do the algebra with respect to the gradients. And then the second idea is that we're going to have a gradient of the value function that we're just going to unroll, okay? And when we're unrolling it, we're sort of the result just falls out. So there's not, you know, it looks a little bit hairy, but it's just algebra, basically, and this idea of unrolling forward the value function using the Bellman equation. Um, okay, so now how do we actually uh, use this? Well, one way to use it is to not estimate the value function and just use Monte Carlo. And in this case, we're going to use full Monte Carlo returns as a proxy for the value of the policy, right? So GT is the target from a full Monte Carlo return. And so we end up here with this formula that basically says we're going to move the policy parameters in the direction indicated by the Monte Carlo return. And then here, we, you notice you have this sort of grad uh, gradient of, of log pi. Okay. It's a very al easy algorithm to implement. Supervised learning people love it. Reinforcement learning people hate it because you have no value function. Okay, you just have these Monte Carlo samples and it has horrible variants. Okay, but sometimes it saves you from having to parameterize the value function separately. Now, because it has horrible variants, you usually want to do something to reduce that variance. And for that, we often borrow tricks from statistics. Okay, in particular, we use baselines. Okay, and the basic idea, okay, if you inspect this, this formula up here, okay, you see that you have this QPI estimate, but, you know, if you stuck in there anything that's constant with respect to the actions and only depends on the state, when you take the gradient, the gradient of that will be zero, okay? So you won't perturb the value of the gradient in any way, but you might affect the variance, right? 
So for example, if you recentered your Q values so that they're mean zero, right? Maybe things are going to, uh, to go much better. So very often, what we will do is we will try to find some baseline, okay? And very often that baseline is going to end up being something like the value function of the state, okay? And so it's just a various reduction trick. Um, and if we're going to use the value of the state, then we might as well parameterize it, okay? And so that's what we do in octocritic methods. Instead of just using the Monte Carlo return, we actually use the usual TDR, okay? And so we can parameterize now the policy with some parameter vector. We can parameterize the value function with a different parameter vector. We can update the value function and we can update the policy parameters at the same time. Um, typically, you're going to have two different learning rates uh, for, for these two uh, updates. But conceptually, all that this does is it pushes the information from the value function into the policy. Okay? And so if you have a good estimate for the value function, or at least an estimate that sort of more reliably indicates the direction of the gradient, that's going to help the policy do better. <coughs> so I wanted to show you an example of this based on an algorithm that's actually um, quite popular right now called the DDPG. Um, let me see if I can get this to play bigger. Okay. So DDPG is a form of policy gradient algorithm, okay? And this video shows several control tasks from the gym suite, okay? This is untrained algorithms followed by, by trained algorithms, okay? So this task is a balancing task where you're trying to keep the pole upright, okay? And you can see that the algorithm is pretty capable of doing that. This is a sort of a cheetah domain where the poor cheetah is trying to move, but at the beginning doesn't know anything. Once it's trained, it happily hops along, okay? And so this is a case where you have uh, actually an action vector, okay, that's pretty high dimensional. And this is a hopper that's supposed to sort of be hopping, and at the beginning it just kind of falls over, and again, at the end, we were doing pretty well. So these algorithms can do quite well on sort of complicated uh, control problems, um, that, uh, that people care about. Now, there's still a question remaining as to um, what, in fact, uh, is a good structure for these policies. And so what I want to do in the remainder of this time <coughs> is to tell you about one specific way of structuring the policy space, um, which I think is actually uh, pretty uh, interesting perhaps from, uh, from multiple points of view. And uh, that is the use of temporal abstraction. Let me sort of back up one step, okay, and think about what we've done so far, right? So reinforcement learning, you have policies, and the policies are interesting, and they can be learned, and so on. But they're not like the kind of things that people do, okay? People take actions and reason at multiple timescales. And even when we do very simple things like, you know, making dinner or planning a trip or something like this, there's many different levels of abstraction at which stuff goes on very seamlessly, right? So if you're planning a dinner party, you're thinking in terms of what kind of recipe and who do you invite and so on. And your muscles know how to stir and, you know, pour things and, and do all this kind of stuff. And you can also do sort of medium level things so while you're cooking, you can keep track of time and make sure stuff doesn't burn and so on. And all of that goes on in parallel and it's, it's very much integrated. But in our agents, we have some fixed time scale that comes with the MDP, somebody hands that to you and then you say, okay, every time take you take an action. That seems very limiting, okay? And it does uh, mean that the policies have to do a lot of work, right? To figure out all these kinds of complications. Now, you know, if you take a step back and you think about programming and programming computers, okay, what we do in reinforcement learning is a little bit equivalent to programming in assembly language. Okay, you have a, kit, a toolkit of instructions, they're micro, okay, and now you can write any kind of program you want, but it's going to take you forever and it's hard to debug and it's prone to errors, okay. 
So what do we do in programming languages? Well, we make languages and we make libraries, okay? And then you write subroutines and you can call them, you write functions and you can call them. And that means your overall program is much easier to, to write. And so we're gonna try to do the same kind of thing here, okay? with temporal abstraction. And I'm going to uh, sort of describe the framework first and then give you a little bit the context. So the, the framework that I'm going to talk about is what's called the options framework. And the idea is to build chunks of behavior that are a little bit like behavioral programs that start and stop and encapsulate some behavior together with knowledge about how we model that behavior. And so a typical example would be something like a controller in robotics. If you have a robot, you want to say, you know, go to the wall, you might write a controller that says, let me read the sensor. If there's nothing in front, we're just going to move the robot in front until the sensor bumps. When it bumps, we stop the behavior, right? And so an option has three components, sort of equivalent to, to this example. You have an initiation set. That means where can I start the behavior? It has an internal policy which means how do we execute, what do we do at that time, and it has a termination condition. And in the internal policy, it's possible to call some other behavior, okay? Just like in a program, it's possible that you make a call to some other function which calls some other function and so on. So we allow for that. Um, the internal <coughs> policy, one way you can think about it is that it only calls primitive actions, but there's again nothing sort of preventing you from calling other things. The termination condition, we think of it as a stochastic termination condition uh, because otherwise, you know, given the uncertainty in the environment, it would be hard to make the math work, okay? And so you think of this beta of S as a probability of terminating at any particular state. Um, so now we're going to, so there's, a, there's actually a sort of a rich literature and temporal abstraction. <clears throat> There's first of all a rich literature in classical AI that talks about planning with macro actions and so on. There's also literature, rich literature in sort of traditional control methods, especially in hybrid control that uses this kind of view of having layers of controllers. Um, but even in reinforcement learning, there's been lots of work that's been done. So options is one particular framework. That's <laughs> perhaps the closest to the heart of reinforcement learning, but there's other ways of, of sort of formulating uh, this type of knowledge and this type of behavior. Okay, so we're going to think of these options essentially as behavioral programs, and the typical way that we will think about the execution model is call and return. So call and return means that you have this library now of subroutines that we call options, Whenever one of them can apply, it could be called by the policy over options. So pi omega is going to be the policy over options. That's the overall program. It can call options. Whenever an option is called, you put it on the, on the stack, okay? And now it has a local context, right? And the context has the state from the environment. What option am I executing? And in principle, it could have local variables. So one typical thing that people do is they keep track of time. Right? because they might want to stop this particular subroutine after some amount of time has elapsed. So you can have these kinds of local variables there. Um, and now during the, the execution, we're going to pick some actions. Right? These are our instructions. Um, until the termination condition is reached. When the termination condition is reached, we pop back up right? and we can initiate another option. So pi omega is going to be an interesting quantity. This is the policy over options. We would like to learn that. Um, and again, in principle, the options can call each other. Uh, although in practice, we've in fact never seen uh, any advantage from doing this more than with one layer of options and one layer of primitive actions, which suggests to me that the problems that we're looking at are perhaps not complicated enough. For us, to, uh, for us to require more, more structure than that. Now, <clears throat> we can add to this a form of interruption. And the idea of interruption is that as the agent is going along and it's observing the state, perhaps there's something better to do that becomes available, right? 
you're walking down the street trying to get to work and then you notice the bakery and it's got, you know, fresh croissants and, you know, the best thing to do is to go and grab one, right? So you don't want to do call and return. You don't want to say, oh, I'll go all the way to my office and then I'll actually come back for the croissant, right? You would just want to interrupt the behavior, do the action and then continue along the way. And so interruption allows us to do that. Um, I think of this as a special form of concurrency, but I'm not an expert in concurrent programming, so I don't know if this is the right way to think about it or not. Um, the other thing that I will point out is that the fact that we remember the option identity is kind of interesting. It is a form of memory, but it's not memory about the past, about the things that we've seen. It's really memory about what we're trying to achieve. Okay? One way we think about this is the agent has the overall goal, but it also has some sub-goal in mind. Right? Maybe the overall goal is to get a PhD, but the sub-goal is to write the next paper. Okay? And that's the option, right? And then you have to keep that in mind as you're, as you're picking options. Now, in this case, we specify things to policies at termination conditions. These other alternative formalisms that exist do this kind of specification in various ways. Okay? Uh, for example, there was this framework called MaxQ by Tom Dietrich, also very popular, that uses graphs and basically uh, decomposes an MDP into subtasks and then makes a graph of these subtasks, and that describes the behavioral program. Hierarchies of abstract machines actually uses finite state machines, right, for the same kind of purpose. <coughs> and then there has been some work that's actually very close to programming languages that basically allows you to specify these kinds of programs where some parts of the program are given and other parts of the program are learned. So from the mechanics point of view, there's actually lots of different ways of doing this. But uh, the theory actually is all kind of the same. And interestingly, the theory uh, really relies on models. Okay. So what I described to you, initiation set policy termination condition, is about how you execute things, right? It's sort of the syntax. But it's interesting to think about what's the semantics. And in reinforcement learning, really the semantics is given by what a particular action achieves, right? What's the model? Well, how much reward does it get? And what's the distribution of states that we can see at the end? And so here we need the same kinds of quantities. We need to keep track of them. So for each option, we're going to have an expected reward, right? Which is the return during the option execution. And then we're going to have a transition model, p omega. It's not exactly a probability distribution anymore because we tend to model the duration together with the states, and so it ends up being a subprobability distribution, actually, that's controlled also by gamma. And so it basically says, where is this agent going to be when the option terminates, and how long will that take to happen, sort of messed, messed up together. And... Uh, it's similar to the case that I showed you before in the one-step case where we take the discount factor and we put it together with the transition probability matrix. There are two we end up with a sub-probability distribution because it sums then to gamma, not to one. Uh, but here, in fact, we're going to have different durations that depend also on the state. So these two things are not independent quantities. We're going to have to learn it. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is we have reinforcement learning all the way. So models are, in fact, the same kind of thing as a value function. And so me methods that can be used to learn value functions can apply, in this case, to learning the models. So we're not going to have to invent something new to do that. Any other questions? So we think of the option models as, as providing semantics, okay? Uh, and in particular, we can think of them as providing a form of sort of post-condition, right? What happens after the option has executed? Well, you've gotten some reward and you've arrived at some state. Um, <clears throat> and there is a, a semantics to, to putting together these models. It's actually compositional. And it's pretty much the same as in the case of primitive actions. So once the primitive actions, you can take the reward and the transition matrix and put it in homogeneous coordinates. 
and then you raise things to the power and you get these n step models. Okay? Well, now you can take models of options, take the reward and the transition probabilities, put them in homogeneous coordinates, and you can multiply these things and you get the semantics of sequencing. Okay? So m1 times m2, it's really take, telling you what's going to happen if I start, I execute the first option, and then I execute the second option. And we can similarly get a stochastic choice. Okay? And those are really the two things that, that we actually need for, um, for the space. And then we get Bellman equations. Okay? Not, not every pair of options can be composed, right? You have to have one ending where the other one can start. Brilliant remark, yes. That's ex exactly right. So, and that uh, causes a lot of headaches, which people <coughs> sometimes avoid by saying, well, options apply everywhere. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that you don't have to, uh, to think about it. <coughs> but yeah, that, that is, in practice, that is a problem. If you want it to have initiation sets, then you better have... A type system. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there, there is actually potentially a very interesting research space that would look into type systems for these kinds of things and would help us actually do initiation sets properly, which we don't do right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, none of that has been done. We've just been avoiding the problem basically for 20 years. So, um, There's been actually a very nice paper from uh, David Silver and Kamil Chosek that, that uh, does this kind of thing where they rewrite the model in homogeneous coordinates and then they do Towers of Hanoi. Of course, Towers of Hanoi is a problem where you know the model exactly. And so now you can just do compositions. And out of those compositions emerge solutions to very large Towers of Hanoi problems. Um, so it's a, it, they sort of demonstrate scaling up in an interesting way. So what happens when you put options in a Markov decision process is you obtain what's called a semi-Markov decision process. So a Markov decision process, you have states, actions, and rewards, and you have one time scale, right? And the Markov part basically means that the next state and the reward only depend on the current state and the current action and not, nothing in the previous history. In a semi-Markov process, you also have a duration for the transition, which is probabilistic, but its probability, again, only depends on the current state and the current option in our case and nothing that's happened before. Okay, so it's Markovian at that level. The rewards and the distribution over next states are also only dependent on the current state and the current option and nothing from before. So we're going to have a semi-Markov process at the level of the decisions over options. But actually, we still have typically an MDP that's underlying everything, right? And in principle, we could actually have many layers. We could have an MDP with several layers of semi-MDPs on top. And that means that we can use reinforcement learning tricks and techniques at all the levels. Okay? So anything that I told you about learning policies, learning value functions, different kinds of backups, and so on, we can now do it at all levels. Um, so essentially all of the planning and learning algorithms that we have in classical MDPs transfer directly to semi-MDPs with this caveat that, of course, now you have to keep track of the appropriate discounting, right? But, uh, but that's something that, that uh, comes uh, immediately. Also, all theoretical results are of the same flavor, right? So algorithms that converge for MDPs also converge in their semi-MDP counterpart. And for those that we don't know, uh, how to do things, well, we still don't know. Um, the advantage is that you get speed in planning and speed in learning. And so this is a simple illustration to kind of um, see <laughs> what the benefit might be. This is a very simple navigation task where the agent can go up, down, left, or right. There is a goal state, which is the green dot. The value at the goal state is 1. And you would like the agent to learn how to do the best thing possible from all of the environment. And in this case, for the beginning, we're going to assume that actually the model is given. So you know what your actions do. You know that when you go up, most of the time you will end up in that intended cell. And some of the time you're going to slip and end up in a random cell in the neighborhood. Okay. So now we can do a value iteration, for example, with the model. <laughs> 
Okay, what would the value iteration do? Well, it propagates the reward from the goal back towards the other states. Okay, and so it's the top row over there. You start with just the value at the goal. In the first iteration, the two states that are next to the goal get some value, and then in the next iteration, the states that are two steps away from the goal get some value, and so on. And so the values are going to slowly, slowly propagate all along the environment. <coughs> now, you can see that this is going to be slow, especially if the environment is very big. Okay? And this goes back to one of the points that I made at the beginning in terms of cursive dimensionality. If you have very sparse information, right, and if you're doing one-step backups, like dynamic programming does, it takes forever for that information to propagate. Now, we could do something like 10-step backups, right? What would that mean? We would take the model, raise it to the 10th power, right? Now it was a sparse matrix. It's going to become a bit of a denser matrix, right? And then information would propagate faster. Options achieve the same kind of net effect, but by using a model that corresponds to the option. Okay? So in this case, we've given the agent, to begin with, some options that take it to hallway states, the states that are, that are in between the rooms. We've learned those ahead of time. Okay? And if you have one of these models, if you have a goal state here, in one step of value iteration, you propagate the values to both of these neighboring rooms because the model lets you do that. Okay? And then in the next step of value iteration, you now have estimates everywhere. They're not correct yet, right? Because still the iterations have to go. You, you know, your values are going to wiggle. But the value propagates very, very quickly, much more efficiently. Um, you know, how do I think of this in the context of, let's say, using an n-step model versus using something like this? Well, in an n-step model, you're essentially iterating the same action over and over again, right? Whereas here, we're iterating based on these policies that can be more informed. Okay? Now, of course, somebody has to make sure that they're more informed, right? And so a big part of the puzzle is going to be how do we learn what's the right resolution of these models and what would be good policies and what would be good models to leverage. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So we're going to do planning with option models just like planning with primitives. We can learn these models using temporal difference style methods because really there's MDPs all the way down. Um, and we can get some advantage. This is just to show you what TD looks like at the semi-Markov decision process level, right? It looks just the same as the previous TD algorithm, except in the previous n step TDs, we had a fixed n here, okay, and now the n is a random variable. Instead of having a little n, I have a big n t. It's a random variable that depends on the option that I've chosen, okay? Um, but other than that, all of these algorithms are going to look all the same. And we can do Q learning, we can do SARSA with options, we can do all these things uh, in more or less the same way. Now, how are we going to learn the reward options for uh, the reward option models? Well, the reward is actually a value function itself. Okay. Uh, it basically says, we'll take the option. The option will choose primitive actions. Those primitive actions have some reward. And then when we arrive at the next state, first of all, we decide whether to continue or not. Okay. If we continue, with probability 1 minus beta, we continue then we're going to get the next reward, OK? And so it looks just like before, except instead of just having this discount from the environment, you have further discount because you might have decided to terminate. Okay? But these quantities would be known for, for any option. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we can learn the models again in the same way that we've always done. We can also use Q-value learning. So all of these things we can just generalize. It's not really um, nothing too interesting there. The more interesting bit that I want to, to tell you about and sort of where the current research frontier is, 
is where do these options come from, okay? And that's a complicated question, right? I mean, when you're writing code, let's say, how do you decide that something should be put in a library? Well, there's some heuristics that you use, right? Maybe you think that this is going to have to be reused later, right? Or maybe it was just so complicated to write or you're so proud of it that you just want everybody to see it, and so you put it in a library. Okay, but, but there's not one clear-cut answer. And we would like to have a clear-cut answer because we would like these to, to be built automatically from data. <coughs> and so we think of this as what people sometimes call a representation discovery problem. We want to, to find out what are the right timescales at which we want to act and model the environment. <clears throat> now, traditionally, people have had some somewhat heuristic approaches that are all, in some sense, inspired by this idea of navigating through hallways and rooms and doors. Okay? And the idea is uh, that there are some states in the environment where you would like to go because they open up possibilities. And sometimes people call these bottleneck states. So hallways are one of these kinds of situations. If you want to go from any room to any other room, you'll have to pass through a hallway, and therefore they're somehow interesting. And you can also detect them by looking at the data distribution because they choke trajectories, right? In a room, maybe you have a somewhat uniform distribution of visiting if you don't know very much, but then all trajectories have to go through there if they go then to someplace else. So there's been quite a bit of literature exploring this idea of detecting bottleneck states. It's cool, it's intuitive, but it's computationally very intensive because it all boils down to analyzing graphs of transitions that can be very big, and so therefore they don't scale very well. And they're, in some sense, uh, very com combinatorial in nature. The, the nicest one, perhaps, is this recent work by Marlos Machado and, and uh, Mark Belmar. Uh, but even in this case, uh, there's, there's expense in terms of the amount of computation and the sample size that's needed. Another kind of approach that people have used is what's called uh, in signal processing change point detection. And this is sometimes used in robotics. George Conidaris has done a lot of nice work on this. The idea being that uh, you can look at the time series of information that's generated by the behavior and look at where the distribution of data changes, and that's where you want to segment, right? And it turns out that you can detect hallways and bottlenecks in this way because typically your readings in one room are different than your readings when you're going through a narrow passage. And so if you can detect that automatically using change point detection methods, you can make that a sub-goal, and then you can learn how to get there and learn the models and all these other things. So there's interesting uh, applications like this in robotics control, some of them using Bayesian reasoning for this. Um, and they do end up sort of giving you advantages in terms of um, the, the length of, of time that you spend uh, reaching a solution. But again, it's somewhat dependent on the nature of the problem, right? Change point detection relies on assumptions about the distribution of data and the kind of noise that you'll encounter in the environment. People have also tried to use uh, learning from demonstration. So that means there's a person that's demonstrating some trajectories and then you know that they're going to use this kind of layered reasoning. Can you actually figure out what's in their head? Right, so we can posit a latent variable model for what they're thinking about and try to, uh, to infer those latent variables. Works to some extent. Uh, there's been some interesting applications in robotics and in, and in some game playing that are of this flavor. What we have decided to do, actually, is uh, take simpler approaches and more directed approaches. So I'll tell you two different things. The first one, <coughs> is an approach that sometimes people call generate and test. That means let's just sprinkle some options at random and then use them. And uh, we're going to figure out which ones are useful and which ones are not. And the, way to, the easiest way to do this is basically to think of sprinkling sub-goal states in the environment at random. Sometimes people call these landmarks. And then uh, we're going to... So I'll show you an illustration of this. This is a little navigation task here. And we've put in some, some random positions in this environment. 
okay, which are the centers of these ellipses. And we're going to assume that we actually, from within one of these circles, we can reach the center fairly reliably. Okay? So uh, we have some kind of rough planner, maybe a deterministic relaxation of the original problem in order to solve each of these things. Uh, so you can think of these things as like little lily pads. So the agent now can figure out how to jump from lily pad to lily pad rather than trying to work in primitive space. And you can, of course, see that this is by no means optimal because we just sprinkled them around randomly. So there are some areas where we, ha we have none, and there are some other areas where we have too many, right? Um, but it's very fast to generate. And then, in principle, you could look at them and see which ones are used. And the ones that are not used, you could weed them out, right, and just keep the ones that are useful. We actually don't do that in this specific um, algorithm, but one could. So this is just comparing... Um, what happens when we do value iteration with just primitive actions versus value iteration also using these landmarks, okay? And value iteration with just primitive actions, the goal is to get from this corner to the opposite corner, okay? And in the case of primitive value iteration, the agent is just stuck, okay? It's kind of moving around randomly in here. Uh, and nothing's happening because it's not yet managed to get out of the corner because it has very small actions. Over here, what it can choose is to jump to some other neighboring pad, okay? And so you get the trajectory, which is by no means optimal, right? It's not straight or anything, but actually does manage to get to the other room, and now it's in that corner looking for the goal, okay? And the reason it's not wiggling in this corner is that of course, if, it's, if it can choose to move in between these lily pads and they're not exactly aligned with the goal, right, it'll take it a little bit of time until it actually finds that. But finding a successful trajectory is much, much faster. And we've tried this with some other domains. This is another uh, domain called pinball. So it's one of these tasks where you have a maze with holes and you have to navigate uh, a ball through that maze. Uh, and again, this is the, the primitive action curve here, the red curve, and these alternatives that, that use options are way faster, and the time per iteration is much smaller. Okay. So that, that's a win. So the clarification, once the, you find the, the path to the goal, because the granularity is more poor, when, this, when, when you will deploy the agent, how do you map this to the actions of the agent? So what you do is, uh, there's, so there's two things you could do. If you do call and return, you'll always pick, you know, one of the landmarks and then go to that landmark and keep going from landmark to landmark. And only if you're in between, you're going to choose primitive actions. Uh, the better approach is to use interruption. So you, you uh, start going towards a landmark, but if you observe another landmark that actually has better value, you will interrupt and deviate, Right. Um, and that kind of straightens out the path. But in principle, in the long run, what you would like is actually to modify the set of landmarks. So drop the ones that are unused and add landmarks around the trajectory that is used. Right? So we're going to have to move towards something more like this, so sort of gathering these landmarks along the trajectories that are actually successful. <coughs> Other questions? Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about our current work, which is a bit more informed than this. The previous work that I showed you actually has some interesting theoretical properties. We did a, an analysis, a complexity analysis, that essentially shows that um, using these kinds of uh, landmarks, even if they're sprinkled at random, uh, improves the concentrability coefficients of the resulting um, sort of system. Um, and so that means that uh, basically uh, we're going to be more efficient because typically people in reinforcement learning make sample complexity bounds based on concentrability coefficients. Uh, we get a little bit better um, results than just using primitive actions. But there's, this, is, this was just a beginning kind of analysis. So again, there's a lot of room for, for improving on these results. The bounds are not as tight as they could be. Now, more recently, we've actually tried to build on this idea of uh, 
uh, policy gradient in order to uh, obtain better methods and faster methods. And uh, the idea really is that what we want is to state an optimization objective for the options and then solve it. Um, and we would like to do this in continual fashion, not, not using combinatorial style, style computations, and ideally get improvement within one task rather than just get improvements if you're going to have to solve a whole series of MDPs. And, of course, the one algorithm that I've told you so far that kind of has this flavor is the actor-critic architecture, right? So, again, this is a picture of actor-critic where you have your value function and the policy, <coughs> and the value function is providing gradients to the policy. Now, of course, in our case, we're going to have a bit of a different structure for the policy, and we're going to have a different structure for the value function in order to account for the fact that we have options. So instead of just one simple policy, we're going to have a behavior policy over options and then a set of options that have each of them their internal policies and internal termination conditions. And so that's all going to be parameterized. Okay. And then for the value function, for the critic, we're going to have two quantities that I'll spell out in a minute that are going to help us push gradients to the policy. And now if we formulate it like this, it becomes just policy gradient. We can sort of code things more easily, right? It's essentially providing a different parametrization for the policy and for how we would do improvement steps. And it, so I'll, I'll show you sort of the upshot of what policy gradient sort of gives us. We're gonna end up with, with a gradient for the policy over options. That one's not particularly interesting, right? It just says move the policy over options to take options that are better. The ones for the internal quantities are more interesting. So the first one says, we want to change the internal policy parameters in a way that chooses better primitive actions. Okay? Um, and QU over there is basically a value function that tells you what's the value of this primitive action in the context of this option. Okay? Uh, so one way to, uh, to sort of parse this is to think, that now, instead of just having the state of the MDP, I have an augmented state where I remember what's my state in the MDP and what am I trying to achieve? What's the option that's executing? And if I consider this augmented state, now I can think of primitive actions in that context, right? And there doesn't have to be a change to any of the algorithms again. I just modified my state. Um, the termination gradient says... You should terminate if your advantage is small and you should continue if your advantage is big. Okay, now what's the advantage? The advantage is the difference between your Q value and the average Q value. Okay, so if you are really good, you should keep going, right? And if you're not that good, right? particularly if you're not better than average, then you should just stop and let somebody else take over, right? That kind of makes sense. Um, so now because this is like purely a gradient-based algorithm, we can take it and put it on top of a deep net. This is now the usual Atari uh, DQN style deep net that I know Hado mentioned. Uh, and we can uh, use it either with DQN or asynchronous actor critic or any of these frameworks that, that people find um, appealing. Um, and the only thing that we need to say is how many options we want the algorithm to learn, then it's going to learn that many options. And uh, this is a set of results obtained in Atari games. Um, and uh, we, what we're looking at here, these red lines, Okay, flat red lines are the previous best performance. And then the green lines are option critic. And this was, in fact, the first time that we've observed an algorithm that learns the representation getting to the same or a better point than algorithms that just try to do flat things. Now, this is a harder task, right? Because you have to learn the options and you have to learn how to choose over them at the same time. And so it's actually quite nice if we can get this kind of uh, result and this kind of improvement. 
The other interesting things is we tried to use this in uh, transfer learning. So transfer learning means you have a task and then the task changes and you want to know how quickly your algorithm adapts to that change. So this is the room's environment. We have an initial position of the goal state and then after a thousand episodes we move the goal state in any one of these red squares in this room. Okay. And so what you see is, so here we're comparing option critic with different numbers of options, as well as actor critic and SARSA, okay? And of course, at the beginning, everybody can learn with the first goal position, how to do things. So these are all the curves going down here. And then we move the goal, okay? So it's, you see this big spike, because now everybody's lost. They don't know where the goal is anymore. They have to find it again, okay? Uh, but then what you see is that these uh, option critic versions are all much, much faster in finding the goal and then propagating the information from that goal compared to actor critic and SARSA, which are over here. So we're getting essentially an advantage when the task changes. There's a certain uh, robustness to modifications of the task. So this is kind of nice. Uh, there is, however, one caveat, which is that in the long run, if you let the algorithm keep going, it will dissolve the options and go back to primitive actions. And there's a reason for that. We know that the optimal policy is fully representable with primitive actions, and so that's, in some sense, what you would expect to see if the only thing that you're trying to do is to optimize return on a single task. And so we tried to think of how to prevent this from happening, right? Because if your intuition is that you should have this as a toolkit, right? A set of options that kind of persists over time, then you would like them to not disappear. And the intuition that we came up with, and this is sort of recent work that's been published in AAAI this year, is that uh, we would like to regularize based on what people call the deliberation cost, right? So if you imagine, you know, a living being or an animal or something like this having to make a decision, okay? Making decisions is hard because you have to evaluate all these choices and your estimates are noisy and you don't really know what the choices are like and so on. Like if you consider, you know, Decisions like going to grad school versus going to industry and making lots of money, right? It's a hard decision to make. Uh, but executing something is actually pretty cheap, right? Once you've settled on something, now it's just like you do it. Um, and so the idea was to somehow model this deliberation cost and penalize the algorithm if it's trying to think too much and make too many decisions. <clears throat> and so the idea here is that we're going to, every time that the algorithm has to switch its option, okay, on these like little red links, we're going to penalize it for that switch, assuming that evaluating those options is somehow more expensive than just executing policies. Again, this is an assumption, okay, it has some biological motivation. Uh, it's an assumption that we can actually translate very easily into math because uh, it turns out that these deliberation costs are just additive, so you can just consider that there's an extra value function that tells you how much it costs you to deliberate. And so it doesn't pollute in any way. The original value function on the environment is just something that you put on top. Um, and so then the objective becomes a regularized objective that says you should maximize your, your reward, but also with reasonable effort, right? And so you're only willing to spend so much energy actually thinking about the problem. And uh, you can actually pretty easily show that what this translates to is basically requiring the advantage to have at least a minimum margin before you switch to a different option, right? So that makes some amount of sense also from the point of view of the sole literature on uh, max margin uh, types of algorithms. So now we, we sort of looked at the effect of this on these Atari games. And we have two kinds of graphs here. On this side, uh, towards me, we have training curves. 
for algorithms, uh, yellow is always no regularization and red is always the most regularization. And what you see is that typically these regularized algorithms uh, have better <coughs> performance, although not always, right? And asterisks don't seem to have an advantage. The other thing that we looked at, though, is the termination rate, right? Because the purpose of introducing these was to prevent these options from dissolving into primitive actions. And so we're looking here at the log termination rate, and what you see is that yellow, no regularization, ends up always terminating, whereas these other things actually lengthen the options quite a bit. And so the, that effect is actually realized. The options now persist um, for a longer period of time. The other thing that we noticed was that there is some interesting qualitative behavior. So this is a game called Amidar. It's one of the Atari suite. And here you have an agent that kind of runs around. There's some enemies here. You have to avoid the enemies. Um, and then you have to collect the keys. And if you run option critic with no deliberation cost, you end up with options, right, that are a little bit temporal extended. So each of these little colored chunks is one option that's been chosen. But actually, they're very, very short in many cases. And they kind of switch all the time. If you put in a deliberation cost, this graph here shows you where the options apply. And the graph over here shows you where they terminate. So you notice two things. First of all, you get much longer chunks. Okay? So an option is actually going to keep going for quite some time. And for another thing, interestingly, we obtain term these terminations at hallways. Okay? Even though that was not programmed, we didn't specifically say we want bottleneck states or hallway states or any of these things. It just kind of falls out of the deliberation cost. And it's actually really because at the hallways, it really matters what you do because there's an actual choice. There's different directions that you go, could go into. And sometimes when you're there, you notice that there's an enemy. and Therefore, you really have to change your mind. Um, whereas when you're in the middle of a hallway, typically it doesn't matter, right? The best thing is just like keep going. Um, and so, uh, so that's sort of the reason why we see these much more uh, focused terminations on the, on the hallways. OK, so I'm going to wrap up here just to sort of um, recap the main ideas. Uh, you know, I hope you guys got a little bit of taste for reinforcement learning through the Torado's lecture and my lecture. Uh, they're really a natural fit for many interesting decision-making applications. Uh, there's uh, some interesting challenges in scaling up reinforcement learning. DeepRL has brought us a new toolkit that scales better, but there's actually still a huge amount of problems that are left unsolved. Um, and in particular, I'm quite interested in doing temporal abstraction, doing it efficiently, finding out better ways of, of uh, getting these algorithms to work uh, in order to incre increase the speed of learning and planning. Um, and one of the things that we've been gradually learning is that uh, handcrafting very carefully options and models and so on is really not necessary. And if you have a lot of data, it's best if you let the algorithms learn these things from the data. Uh, but I still feel like there's a lot of room to say, what's the real optimization objective? And this is something that we're all kind of struggling with. It, you know, MDPs are nice and clean. They have the reward function. It's given to you. But uh, in life, it's not always so clear cut, right? There's many different possible reward functions. They may be activated at different times, right? Sometimes we just do prediction just for the sake of it. Sometimes we're interested in something uh, just because, you know, we're bored with other stuff, right? And those are all the kinds of things that are hard to express in the MDP <coughs> language and uh, ones that somehow still seem to matter. So there's a lot of stuff to do. If you, you know, there are people who are interested in these kinds of questions, then you should look at the field. The Sutton and Barto book, second edition, has a very nice treatment of many of the algorithms. It doesn't have all the proofs. There are other books, like the Shepeshwari book, for example, and Bertsikis has some nice books that show more of the math for the people who are theoretically minded, but there is still a lot of open issues. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, because in this environment, um, 
we could have put them regularly, but in other environments, we may not know how. So for example, one of the tasks that we did uh, was an inventory control task where it was clear what it meant to put inventory sort of landmarks randomly. Uh, but doing things on the regular grid is sort of known to be suboptimal, right? Because usually in inventory control, you want sort of finer resolution around the boundary and then larger resolution away. And so then, you know, then you want, you're sort of putting in more knowledge if you want to do things effectively. So there's this interesting trade-off in machine learning where people try to avoid putting in special knowledge about the task as much as possible. It's sort of like, uh, you know, it's the way we do things. Uh, it's not necessarily always the best practical way to do things, but it's, it's general, and so it has that advantage. Yeah, so the, the, the idea is that if you have, if you evaluate more choices, you're going to be, you're going to have a higher deliberation cost. Um, it's not the only way one could do it. And actually, the experiments that we ran, uh, we used this max margin approach instead. So basically, we put the threshold on the advantage that's required for an option in order to switch out of it. And in principle, these two uh, should be equivalent. But I think in practice, working with the advantage threshold is probably uh, easier to do than to uh, penalize explicitly for for choices. Yeah, and, and certainly if you put this, if you push the deliberation cost to the extreme, you'll get exactly that. So that's another sort of failure mode. So this is the sense in which I don't think that this is the end solution. And there's probably going to be uh, another further refinement that's needed uh, to this framework. And specifically, um, you know, there's this question of whether we really want to look at the single MDP setup or whether we want to look at the transfer learning setup, right? If you look at the transfer learning setup, then it becomes much more natural to think that you're going to uh, need to have many options because, you know, you don't know what task is going to appear next. And if you have a good repertoire, right, then, uh, then you're going to be good. It's sort of the equivalent of saying, you know, if I only solve this problem once, I'll just write the program and be done with it, right? But if I think that I will have to solve similar problems over time, then maybe I want to build the library and call the library. So it's a, it's a similar kind of thing where, you know, we need to refine this a little bit. Uh, I hope so, but I don't have the answer to that. So people have tried to uh, do two things. One is essentially to collect chunks of behavior that seem to be used more often than others, right? So that's the idea. It's akin to the idea of macro actions in classical planning. If you observe a certain sub-policy that's being used in multiple tasks, then maybe you'll just like cash it in. Uh, but that requires already solving multiple tasks in order to observe that something is useful. Um, and then we've, yeah, there's, there's been some approaches that try to look at the structure of policies that emerges in transfer learning or imitation learning and essentially try to infer these kinds of latents. And then the latents can be used to generate behavior in a new context. Um, but it's still quite an open topic. And we have, we also don't have any theoretical results in the case of transfer Right, and many of the approaches um, make specific assumptions about the structure of the task. For example, you're always in the same environment with the same dynamics, it's just the reward function that changes, then we can do more things, right? Uh, but we'd like to have a more general approach.